It's a great pleasure to be here in Berlin, my first time in Berlin. Not my first time in Germany, but my first time in Berlin. And I'm really excited about getting the opportunity to link in here today and to tell you a wee bit about Northern Ireland and maybe um, talk about some of the peace that we don't have there. Um, my name is Mary Brown, as you know, and I grew up in Derry, or Londonderry. Um, our city has two names, because the politicians on either side can't agree on one name. So we all have to, and it, it defines you, if you say Derry, they know who, which side you're on. And if you say Londonderry, they also know. So that's, um, we has still have no consensus on that. I was nine years old when the conflict started. And although I have travelled and worked in other countries, for most of my life I've lived and worked in Northern Ireland. Going, growing up during the conflict was just a way of life, something we came to accept as normal. Guns, bombs, having school friends killed, arrested, um, interned in prison, people just disappearing without any explanation. As horrific as this was as a teenager, in that time, it was just an acceptable norm to me. I didn't realise how abnormal our life was until I moved to the US as a young nurse and I realised how much of our childhood we lost and watching news footage from the US at the current hunger strikers dying one by one was shocking. They were my age, they were young people and governments were letting these people die. And once out, out of Northern Ireland, I gained a sort of different perspective, a more normal one. Much has been spoken in terms of armed conflict in the north of Ireland, primarily centred around paramilitary and state violence. Victims have spoken movingly of their stories, their quest for justice, and justice denied. Horrific as this violence was and continues to be, there is another masked and hidden violence, and we call it the other violence. Thousands of victims have and are still coming through women's aid, rape crisis centres and other counselling services. They have and still continue to suffer horrendous domestic and sexual abuse. They are victims of other violence that is unspoken about. Most frequently, women and children who, who were abused during the conflict, and most certainly, even more so, so after, in the aftermath of the conflict. Those most vulnerable were not a, afforded their human rights. It is not within the wider political interest to expose these people because of their positions. And I talk about some people in positions of power and politics who have also become part of the collusion and sometimes part of the people involved in these crimes. The, vic the victims have become the victors who have now become the persecutors. Um, those most vulnerable are not afforded their human rights and it is not within their the political interest to do so. They have been silenced and remain unprotected, living in fear and suffering this most insidious crime. I have worked with some victims who have had media bans imposed on them. They are not allowed to tell their stories and there has been um, legal, legal injunctions on victims and I've worked with one woman who was abused um, by some political people in Northern Ireland and she is not allowed to tell her story ever for life. So can you imagine that you can't even, some of the ways of healing are to tell and you can't tell. The UN Resolution 1325 refers to this as a political crime. Ironically, I was sent by the Southern Irish government to East Timor to help work and look at the problems in East Timor with women. And I went there, but I live across the border from Southern Ireland and they have never looked into Northern Ireland and the problems and the domestic violence and the sexual abuse that's going on there. Um, both during the conflict and since the conflict. The other violence and their hidden violence is not adequately reported in the crime statistics because there are a range of barriers coming forward and get, getting help. Many are frightened and there is a great deal of threat 
control and coercion still being exercised against very vulnerable women and children and young people. Men and women in paramilitary and in some cases state uniforms used their perceived political and paramilitary status to instill fear in these victims. Perp perpetrators of violence in the streets who perpetrated routinely at home. In Northern Ireland in the last two years there have been over 46,500 incidents reported to police. There have been 13 women murdered. Last year alone, over 46,000 victims called confidential women's aid helplines. Victims have been raped, beaten, tortured, stabbed, burned, mentally, physically and financially abused. Some have completed su suicide, unable to cope. You just have to look at the suicide rates in Northern Ireland uh, amongst women and young people. Some ju just die prematurely. Children lose their childhood. They get lost. And if they turn to drugs or antisocial behaviour, they are routinely marched up lanes and shot in the knees. Some accompanied by their parents who have no choice but to hand them over. Um, can you imagine as a parent having to walk your child up because he, he was taking drugs? They made documentaries about this locally and yet nobody speaks out about it and it becomes the norm, it becomes practice. Um, some have gone through the criminal justice system only to suffer um, further injustice. All deserve recognition and support. I would like to share with you a few stories that resonated with me in the last uh, year of my work. And the first story is, my name is Cathy. I was referred to social services by my teacher when I was at primary school over 20 years ago. I asked my social worker at the age of 11 to take me out of the family home. I wanted to be adopted. I was raped by my father my, and my brothers, but they didn't listen to me. I remained at home and continued to be abused. I was referred to women's aid from college when at 17 I had no money for lunch, despite my family getting a large allowance because I was also disabled. I moved into women's aid at this time. I have been in and out of women's aid services since. I have been systematically raped as an adult by my father and one of my brothers. Um, she couldn't report her rape. She was taken paramilitaries, took her in, and what they have is their own courts. They decide um, in rooms whether the person is guilty or not, and that was the justice she had then because during the troubles, they weren't allowed to go to police. Um, I have been in and out of mental health services. I've been sectioned. I suffered an eating disorder, which has now impaired my health so badly that I will probably not live very long. Two years ago, I decided to prosecute my father and my brother in order to protect my daughter, who, due to my ill health, was given t contact to, to my abusing grandfather and uncle. This year, prior to the court case, my father completed suicide. The rest of my family blame me, and women's need now are my only support, apart from my daughter. Please listen to me now. My name is Jennifer, and I have a daughter and with my ex-partner, whom I have practically no contact for the last seven years, until one night when I was standing outside a bar in the rain, waiting for a taxi with friends. There wasn't enough room in the taxi, and out of nowhere, my ex-partner offered me a lift. I accepted. In the car was three other friends of his and taxi driver. The door closed in the taxi and the first punch came within seconds. All I could feel was my head banging continually against the window of the taxi. Flashing lights and blinking street lights were coming and going. I was drifting in and out of consciousness. I was numb. I couldn't move. What was happening? and why wasn't someone stopping us? The taxi stopped and I was dragged by the heels out of the car and the next I knew I was hanging over the foil bridge by my ankles. I was about to die. I was crying for my daughter but no noise was coming out. 
I could see the water below and could hear voices shouting for him to stop. He brought me up and laughed in my face and over I went again. It stopped and I was put back in the car. I begged with what seemed like my last breath to, pl to please let me go, but I received the next blow and the next until I was knocked totally unconscious. I came round when he pulled me from the car and dumped me at the side of the road. I was partially dressed. No shoes, no notion of where I was. I could taste the blood in my mouth. I could see it dripping on my clothes. I couldn't move. I hoped and prayed someone soon would find me. The three things that will forever stay with me are the feeling of death, the inhumanity of some folk, and three men and a taxi driver watched my life being destroyed in front of them and didn't help. But most of all, the resilience and the determination that I have me and me now to overcome the horror of that night. And only with this support and guidance from Women's Aid have myself and my daughter a chance of getting our life back. My name is Linda. I am 65 year old grandmother. I lived with my husband and suffered domestic violence all my life. It was the time of the troubles and the area I lived in made it impossible to phone the police for help. For me, that was just never an option. My children witnessed all the violence. I eventually got out about 10 years ago and my husband has since died. But that is not the end of my story. I protected my children as the best I could, but you know how it is. You always feel guilty. One of, one of my sons is continuing the learned behaviour and subjecting his partner to extreme violence as my grandchildren witness. I have reported him to social services. I have offered his partner the help that I longed for but never got. For me, it is like living the nightmare all over again as I try desperately to protect my grandchildren. A few months ago, he kicked her into the street as the community watched on but still no one called the police. The troubles are over, but the situation remains the same. I am distraught. I fear that he is going to kill her and I feel powerless. I want him to go to prison because I love him and I know he needs help. The children of these families are rarely heard despite the experiences being no less horrific. My name is Lisa, I am eight years old. I go to bed wearing my socks so that I'm all ready to run if daddy hits mummy in the middle of the night. And I cannot get the image off, out of my head of the 13 year old Caroline who died with her phone in her hand, pleading, help me, help me. Much of the remainder of her call was too graphic to report. At one point she cries, he's, he's. She was the daughter of Lorraine McGovern who died along with her mother and her four brothers and sister at the hand of their father. He burned them all to death in a house three years ago in Northern Ireland. These stories make me sad and they make me angry, but they are also a reason for all of us to be here today, to respond both personally, professionally and politically to the other violence that doesn't get talked about. Women and children are being abused during, have been abused during and post-conflict, and it is not a new phenomenon, as many here will know, in the countries of conflict. However, the lack of honesty, recognition, research and provision for these victims demonstrates a total disregard for their human rights. There has been so far little political will to address these issues amongst those in positions of power across all three governments who signed up to the Good Friday Agreement. There has been some looking the other way for some individuals who commit these crimes or collude to bury them in order to keep the political status quo. A senior civil servant once commented to me, you know, Mary, sometimes sacrifices have to be made and risks have to be taken to get the political results we want. Unfortunately, it is women that 
pay for these sacrifices and its victims of domestic and sexual crime are the ones that are being sacrificed. The politicians brokered a peace that ignored and failed to address the impact and the ongoing domestic terrorism that continues to flourish and has received little to no headlines despite it being every bit as traumatic and damaging as the other atrocities that happened in Northern Ireland. So it is left to organisations like mine to look for solutions and help elsewhere. We have looked to Europe and the USA at your models of good practice. I am in the process of signing up with groups in Europe and the US to develop the first justice centre in Derry. We know this model will effectively break down some of the barriers and begin to address this legacy of conflict in my own hometown. We have already created a treatment centre that will open in the autumn. The fact that we have the highest rate of reporting of these crimes means that we are beginning to instill some confidence to people coming forward. I am delighted to have the opportunity to address this conference and to share the voices of the women that I work with. It is by coming together and working collectively that we will make true and lasting change. We are all here because we care and because we have a significant role to play for these women in Northern Ireland and we all need to be champions in our field to help them and women across the world to get real justice. A justice that includes them, that truly listens, gives them a voice and delivers for them. The greatest barriers and borders to this week work are in people's heads and we have the power as individuals and collectively to challenge and create that change. We all of us have an obligation to stand up against injustice wherever it exists. This year, my city is celebrating the European City of Culture. I wanted to mark it by celebrating the opening of our treatment centre, by making serious progress um, and also announcing the development of a justice centre. I would appreciate your support and expertise, your advice, and I would welcome partnership and opportunity to help us deliver the ac actions and bring the much needed change. I think the words of the Holocaust survivor, Ellie Weasel, writing 50 years ago, are as relevant today when he said, there may be times that we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there should never be a time when we fail to protest. Thank you.